Hi, Emily. How are you today? Hey, Amy, great to see you. Are you home? I am. I am home. It is winter. I have my Buffalo check sweater on. I love it. <laughs> got a little snow in the mountains out the window, but all good. I love Buffalo check. I went through a phase. Um, I was pretty obsessed, like decorating my home with it, trying to find mm -hmm. clothes. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're home because I know you travel a lot. Did you travel at all this week? Not this week. No. Um, but this month we did a Disney cruise with my family. That was the start of the new year and it was good. Like it was so good. I get anxious around the first of the year. Cause as you know, I'm real big on goal setting and like, let's go, you know, let's go after this new stuff. And I was thinking oh, the first week of the year, I'm going to be on a cruise with my family. I'm not going to get after it in my planner and <laughs> do all this goal stuff. And then when I thought about it, it's always on my goal sheet, just because you have to just set those intentions, right? Like to spend more meaningful time with my family. And I was like this, there couldn't be more meaningful time than being on this Disney cruise with my kids and my husband and our friends. And so it was amazing. Uh, so that's that's where I was earlier in the month. Uh, in December, did a little bit of travel. I was in Minnesota uh, for a keynote. And it was the luckiest time in the world to travel because it was 45 degrees in Minnesota and beautiful. So I got in and out and it was successful and fun. So yeah, it's been, it's been a good couple of weeks. Amazing. Um, I was laughing and note-taking when you were talking about having anxiety because it's the beginning of the year and you're a goal person. Um, and I was just going to say, I feel like that is just a, it is something that an entrepreneur learns to live with is the constant pull of have I done enough to prepare? I need to be three steps ahead. What mm -hmm. are my goals? Have I been, you know, have I worked on them enough? Right. And I totally identify with that and it's hysterical, but like you wouldn't really, I mean, I don't think you'd be an entrepreneur or at least as good as you are, if that wasn't part of who you were. Well, I've been conditioned to do it for years because in baseball, you hit January, it's a hundred days till the baseball season starts. So the turn of the new year, like the pressure is on full blast. It goes from sort of this planning off season where you're doing all the right activities to like January one for a long time. Uh, when I was working in baseball, we had a big countdown that started with a hundred and it was on the exterior of the building. So every day you walked in, you would see one last number. And I'm like, we need to stop doing that because I think it's literally going to kill the people who work here. Yeah, exactly. I, understand, I understand it's awareness for the community, like get excited this many days, but everyone who works here is like having a panic attack when they get into the office. So let's, let's X nay the countdown. That is really funny. Yes. You're walking by it every day. <laughs> Please cover that. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. How many more days do I have of freedom before my life becomes a shred of what it is in the off season? Exactly. Um, all right. So I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, this podcast in season four is about the big moves women make to win in business. Okay. And with you there are some clear moves happening. Okay. Um, I've been watching, you know, I don't know how long we've known each other now, um, alongside your journey for quite some time, you always make it look easy. Okay. And, <laughs> you know, following you along in, you know, on Instagram and things like that. I mean, I, love working with women, um, entrepreneurs because they are always multidimensional. Um, the theme comes up every single, every single woman I work with. And, you know, there are these descriptors that, you know, you can write down about, you know, a woman in business or, you know, any human being, but with you, I mean, in knowing you and also following you on in socials, there are all these words. Okay. So I know you're a runner because you post about it. Mm -hmm. I know you, tra you travel quite a bit. I mean, at least it seems like it, right? And you you manage to do these family trips. You have kids. You're a parent. Um, you have three kids. You have a large dog. 
<laughs> do. I have a really big dog. <laughs> I, my favorite was when you got the dog and it was so cute and tiny. And then a week later it was massive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's uh, my best example for like, if you think you can't grow, just look at my dog. He was yeah. the size of an infant when we got him and now he's 210 pounds. So amazing. yeah. It's amazing. Um, so you are a speaker, a keynote speaker, and you mentioned that, and we'll, we're going to dive deeply into that in this episode. Um, you are also a writer. You are also going to school. You also work basically full-time as far as I can tell. Um, and you're tough on yourself, right? You are always setting goals. And I mean, that, that was seven things. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know, there's probably more, right? Um, so whenever I speak to someone, I'm like, okay, you can't, you can't put someone in a single box that every, especially women, multidimensional, um, multitaskers for better or for worse. Um, so I wanted to lead with that because you have accomplished an incredible amount of things, um, you know, since I've known you and you're only just getting started, which is, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch. So, um, I want to, I want to get real. I want to, I want to do, you know, have some real talk. Okay. Um, and jump right in to the lead question, um, which is what is the biggest win that you've had in your recent career that has really set you up for success as a business owner. Yeah. So thank you, Amy. You're always so kind with your compliments. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I don't want to deflect them. I'm going to absorb them and say, thank you and let you help bolster my confidence. I really appreciate that. And, um, the, the biggest one I've had. Okay. So we'll go back two years, almost exactly. So it was January, 2022, where, I left my job. I was general manager of a AAA baseball team. And in that role, I was the first woman to be GM in almost 20 years at, at that level. And during my tenure, during the four years I was there, uh, two other women uh, were named to the GM position, which is amazing progress for our gender. Um, but I left a big role that people would often say to me like, oh, you have a dream job. And you are like, you're doing all these things and you, you have this role and you're so lucky and all that. Um, but as much as I loved my job, like the things that I got to do, lead, lead that team, work with the players, like be a, a figurehead in the community, um, working in baseball was a huge drain on my family. Um, during my last season there, I had my third child and something that is super unique. I think to women is like, we grow the babies. We have the babies. We, you know, my husband is an incredible dad. Like he does a ton with our kids, but you're not the mom, right? It's, like, it's different. <laughs> we do it's, grow the babies. <laughs> yes. We do grow the babies. Yeah. It's different. Um, and when I went back to work after my daughter was born, all of a sudden I left my husband like at, at alone at night with three kids and, um, an infant. And it was like, man, you know, we did it with one, we did it with two. And like, do we really need to do this with three? Like, this is super challenging. And I had planted my flag in the ground. Like I can do anything, you know, we can make it through, we can do this role. Um, but we had, we'd gotten to a point in our lives where it was like, and this is what I talk a lot about with goal setting too. It's like, okay, if this is like the destination, if this is the goal, you reach the goal or you're working towards the goal and then it no longer serves you, like you have permission to pivot and like to let that go. Like you don't have to be in my situation. I thought like, you know, maybe I'm being a martyr and no one even knows it, <laughs> you know, except for myself, like, you can let this go. You did it. You did the thing and you are allowed to grow and change in your life. And I have so much left in my career. I already know this isn't going to be the pinnacle. Like now it feels like the time to let go. And it was very, very difficult to let go of that position. Like it was so hard, Amy. And I, when I did, I did it without having my next thing. Like every other time I'd left a job, I'd like leave on Friday and start on Monday but it was very intentional for me to take a break so I could like recenter 
um, decompress and like have some time with my babies and just figure out like what I was going to do. And it wasn't um, more than a couple of weeks later that I got a text from a friend and he was like, Hey, you should do TEDx. And I was like, okay, th- you know, thanks for sending it over. I'll look at it. The next day I got a text from somebody else. Emily you should do TEDx. And I'm like, all right, I heard this twice. Like I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I had, I had spoken before, but it was more on behalf of the team. And a- after I did so many talks about the team, I was like, I can't help myself. I need to lay in a little bit more information here. And so I would do a little bit more teaching on like personal development or how to achieve your goals. And, and then when I would leave the podium, people would be like, wow, that was awesome. I thought you were just going to talk about baseball, but like, you really gave me some great advice. And so that, that had planted the seed. So when they said audition for TEDx, I was like, okay, I just got to figure out like what I'm going to say. And at that point, uh, my podcast leadership is female. I've been live for two years and I'd had so much advice from these amazing women on the show. And I knew the things that resonated with the audience. And I spoke to them and I thought like, I'm going to do a talk on confidence. I went into the form. I literally made it up as I went, like filling out this form and hit submit. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a call from the event organizer and he was like, okay, Emily, um, you made it into the top. I think it was like top 80 and the committee, you know, was looking at it and like, Then you made it into the top 50 and then you made it into top 30, but in order to choose you, like you need to tell me why I should pick you. And I'm like, okay, like, what do you mean? He goes, well, your topic is confidence. And if you go to the TEDx channel, there's literally an entire section dedicated to confidence. What makes yours so different? And I was like, Ooh, Okay. Challenge accepted. And I got to sell this to you, like literally right now over the phone. And I thought about how different messages hit different at different times to different audiences. And so that's what I talked about. I was like, Brett, listen, people haven't heard about confidence from me at the time where I'm going to deliver this talk. Like, have you ever been to the creamer aisle at the grocery store? There's almond milk, whole milk, um, oat milk and a million different flavors under the sun, even depending on the season. Like, does that stop people from producing a different creamer? No, like they just keep coming and different people like them at different times. And I said, that's how my talk will be. Like my voice, my message will hit a different audience in a unique way than what they've already seen. He's like, all right, well, you got me with that. What are you going to talk about? And I'm like, oh my God, like I haven't developed the points. Like what am I supposed to say, you know? And so I, um, I just start like pitching just based on things I've said previously and stuff that's, that I've learned on the show. And, um, he's like, all right, I think we got something here. Um, you could, you got a spot you you're in the top one. Yeah. And, um, and then I went through the TEDx gauntlet where at least at the show in Reno, it's like essentially three different auditions still in order to get to the stage where they're giving you feedback and trying to make it the best short talk of your life. And, um, day of there's all sorts of stories around like what that event experience was like, but I went up there and had a freaking blast. I was like, I get this one shot. Like, I'm not going to sit up here and let my knees wobble. Like I'm going to own this stage. And I did. And, um, just so happens that when they submitted it to TEDx, TEDx really liked the video and held it um, till August of that year and released it in their newsletter. And um, by the end of the year, what, three and a half months later, it was the number 12 talk of the 16,000 uploaded to the YouTube channel that year. So it was a huge turning point for me to um, activate my speaking career. Amazing. So many questions, lots of notes. My paper is now starting to look like a crazy tattooed, you know, I don't know. Um, can I ask some questions about this? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Where do I begin? There's so many things that you brought up throughout the story that are amazing, that could create individual episodes on their own. One, leaving sports, okay? That moment, I've been through it. So many people I know have been through it. The fear 
of everything I've built now, where does it go? Um, I have a prestigious career, you know, and there's a little bit of glitz to working mm -hmm. in the sports biz. There's some pride there. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to get in. And that's another thing. It's like, crap, I got in and now, and this is why there's no turnover at the team level. Like, people are afraid to leave. So there's that theme and let's, you know, maybe save it for a second because I really want to get a little further into, um, the, this Ted talk. Okay. So you sold yourself on the spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's incredible. It tells me something about you because as you were telling the story, you know, I'm thinking if this is me, I am highly anxious. Three auditions. Are you kidding me? Um, I need to hear more about that. But when you found yourself on the phone, you said his name was Brett, I think. Yeah. TEDx. Did you tap into your salesperson at that moment? Like, how did you find it within yourself to, you know, be confident, quite frankly, enough to say, yeah, here's my plan with, and you didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's the thing I wanted it, right. I had, I, he was sitting here on the phone telling me that I was essentially at the finish line. I just needed to, you know, run through it, but in order to have, uh, have the go power, like I, I needed to convince him and in sports, I worked in sales uh, for a long time. And, um, I don't think I was always like the best salesperson. I think I was really tenacious. You know, if you let me know, like there was a chance you were going to buy, like I was going to continue to follow up. We'd come up with new ideas. Like I, sometimes I work with clients for three years before they said yes, because you know, I, I wasn't going to let it go until you told me like, this is never going to happen. Um, you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah. So you're telling me that there's a chance. Okay. Uh, and so I, I was like, all right, I'm almost there. I'm, I cannot let this go. Like now I really want it. And I got to convince this guy to give it to me. And I tapped into, you know, one, a, a thing that I talk a lot about when I discuss confidence and how to increase your confidence is like practicing the behaviors that lead to the attitude change and practicing the behaviors is what gives you that mental Rolodex of like surviving these tough ex experiences or tough conversations. And it also expands your comfort zone. Like had I not had so many uncomfortable conversations or pitches on the spot in my career, like I wouldn't have been able to nail that conversation. Um, but the only reason I had those experiences is because I chose to like get in the arena and, and grow, um, as, as a person, as a seller, as an executive. And when you do that and you've survived, you know, you can tap back on that experience because you saw yourself, you know, behaving in that way and have it had produced the results that you wanted in the future. So, for me, it was like, you know, I, I, I think like as, as people we're very multi-dimensional, you know, like you can, I don't think you're fake if you act differently in different situations. Like I don't talk to my kids, like I'm speaking on stage, right? Like that's Emily who's, who's elevated because the room will swallow you up if you don't elevate your voice, your actions, your movements, um, I don't talk to my kids that way. That doesn't mean that the Emily on stage is an Emily or the Emily with their kids is an Emily. Like you need to be able to kind of ratchet up these areas of your personality or who you are in these different situations. And that's what I did on the phone. I was like, oh, I see where we are right now. Okay. That person can do it. Yeah. And, you know, I turned her on and we went after it. I love it. And you said some things too, just then, you know, the idea of, I've survived this before. That's big when you're talking about going into a situation where confidence is required or necessary. Um, you're tapping back into your experiences. And so that's a really good tangent because another thing you talked about was that you had started podcasting two years prior to this moment. 
Um, you also had speaking experience, albeit not, you know, from your personal point of view about confidence, but you were on the podium before, you know, in front of crowds before. And so again, you had done it before. This is just like, you know, different. And of course, um, a larger audience. So, um, so all that makes sense to me and it, and it kind of brings it all together to say, okay, you were in the right place at the right time. There were signs. You took the step of applying. You did something right in your application where you shined through and made it into the final, you know, selection, sold yourself through on the spot. And suddenly you had yourself a TEDx talk in the making. Um, something that I wanted to ask you about, because I've seen these photos several times and obviously um, your TED talk, you said has had millions of views and is ranked um, number 12 uh, in 2022 on YouTube. Uh, so the pink blazer, yeah. <laughs> I have it circled and starred. Um, Tell me about that. Was that your choice? Was it TEDx? You know, what went into that choice? Amy, I literally had these clothes in my closet. Like I didn't even pick out my outfit. I think till like the day before, two days before I didn't shop like nothing. Like I owned those shoes, those pants, that belt, that shirt, that blazer. And I put the whole thing together. And what was funny is like the, the uniform, it seems for TEDx is for women to wear like a sheath dress, like a, like a single color dress. And yeah, I wear dresses from time to time, but I'm like, I'm definitely a pants person when it comes to work. And I was going to wear pants. I debated wearing jeans, honestly. And I ended up picking those like painted black jeans um, to wear and I wanted, um, I love a great blazer. It was like my, my trick. If I, um, back when I was a GM, if I was like disheveled, <laughs> I would throw on a blazer over whatever shirt I had and, you know, put my hair back tight and like, we were good to go. Like I looked like a boss, you know? So I, um, I picked the blazer and it just so happened. So I didn't even realize this until, you know, many, many months later that one well, friend of mine pointed out, she's like, man, you picked the right color. Cause this was like in the Barbie movie era. Um, yes. and I, it was like totally unintentional. It was, it was just a good, a good choice. Um, I had thought about, I have one that solid blue, like a cobalt blue. It's really pretty. And I didn't want to wear it. Cause I thought it was, it would be too dark. Like I wanted something that was bright and popped out. And I knew that there'd be some combination of red and black in the background because those are the TEDx colors and um yeah I went with I went with the blazer but no literally nobody helped me I already had those clothes in my closet and I think that's part of the best the best part about it is like I I don't overanalyze that stuff you know I did a big keynote in um I did two in Minnesota this fall and the first one that I did my cousin lives in Minnesota and her and I I uh, went shopping the night before we met up and went to dinner and went shopping at the mall of America. And I was like, Hey, uh, do you want to pick out an outfit for me for my keynote tomorrow? <laughs> and I had stuff in my suitcase, uh, but she, uh, we went shopping and she picked out this red blazer and red pants and it was just perfect. And I've ended up using, you know, that outfit quite a bit over the last few months. Um, but I just, I like, as focused as I am, like I leave some gray space to just let some things happen uh, because I think it's magical. Like I'm very goal directed, but uh, you got to still keep your eyes open and your head up because sometimes your goal is like a waypoint. It might not be like the final destination. Absolutely. Um, hilarious. It was in your closet. Um, I think it works really well visually which is why I was curious um, as to whether TEDx had anything to do with the selection. Um, it's kind of iconic in the sense that, um, you know, you got millions of views and it, it just, there's something about the pink blazer that feels iconic. I'm almost like wanting to tell you to just wear it to every single, you know, talk because it's sort of in a way signature to you. Um, Love the Barbie thing. That's so funny. I, I didn't even think of that. 
Um, but so is it fair to say then that the TEDx talk launched your speaking career? Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair because I, in order, and maybe we'll get into this later, but like in order to level up my speaking career at this point in time, I need to sell. Like I need to go back to my roots and do sales. I need to do outreach to people to say, I am available. Consider me for your event. I haven't done that yet. The TEDx talk has um, led to almost every opportunity that I've had. And the TEDx talk led to a book. And then the book pre-sale led to me booking additional speaking gigs because I went out there and, and you know, got got on the got on the phone, got on the email and started, you know, selling the opportunity to, to buy my book early. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, and now I'm now for this business, like it, TEDx launched the, the legitimacy of like what I'm trying to do. And, um, and now in order to get to the next level, now it's time for me to get to work again. Yeah. But you're good at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I have to ask, um, you did the TEDx talk, you suddenly became an in-demand keynote speaker, um, talking about confidence. And I don't know when your first gig was after the TED talk, but I want to ask generally speaking, and this is for anyone that's listening that is endeavoring to one day potentially be a keynote speaker, whether it's doing one or many, and Emily is sort of perfecting this art of making it like this uh, mainstay part of her revenue stream as a business owner. Um, I'm curious to what, as a, if you're willing to share the range of what you might get um, for a single keynote. Um, and then I want to talk more about what goes into your preparation for it. Yeah, um, absolutely. So there's also, I'm looking at my bookshelf because there's a great book on this topic um, by Grant Baldwin. And um, what's it called? Uh, I'll think of the name. Anyway, it is a, it's a speaker's guide to, to starting your business. Um, he wrote a book on it. It's a playbook and it also includes ranges for what you could charge depending on um, your set of experience. So when you first start, uh, you're going to do it for free or you're going to do it um, between free and a thousand dollars, I would say. Um, before you can charge a thousand bucks, you have to have experience. Um like speaking and have a, have something to, to present. Um, after you've done a number of keynotes, um, you can start to charge between seven and $10,000. Um, that is the range that I'm in for an hour long keynote. And, um, and sometimes I will extend that to, you know, a two to three hour workshop, depending on the client and like what their needs are. And then when you are a best-selling author, uh, celebrity, um, you can charge between like 20 and 25 and $50,000 for a keynote. Um, and when you are in that mid range between like, you're not a celebrity, um, but you you're like an industry expert in speaking, you charge between like 10 and $20,000, um, for your, for your talks. That is, from my experience, the ranges um, that that I am aware of, and I will tell you that it is you're not paying for an hour. The client isn't paying for an hour; they're paying for your collective knowledge, which could be 10, 15, 20 years, um, and they're paying to hear from somebody who's done it, who can leave an opportunity for results for the audience. Like, what are you trying to accomplish through your keynote talk. And, um, for us who are not celebrities, you know, I heard Bo Jackson talk and he just told a bunch of stories, right. About his history. Like he didn't really leave us with, uh, you know, I'm going to go out and do this. It was, it was just an opportunity to hear from him. Like that's a lot different than 
what you're doing as a professional speaker generally at, at conferences or to employer resource groups, you're trying to move the needle for the company. So you need to have a, a value proposition. Like what is it that you can do for this group that they should pay you this amount? Um, I will say that it is landing a gig is not different from selling a sponsorship or selling tickets. You know, you propose yourself um, for the opportunity. Uh, you schedule a call to do your pitch. Um, a lot of times I send over a proposal and then um, hopefully I win the business. And when I do, um, I have a have a um, a number of signature talks and signature, uh, breakout sessions, programs that I can do. And so the client will, they've chosen me because I have those, right? Like if you're a speaker, you can't say like, oh, I could speak about anything. What do you want me to speak about? Like that doesn't work. Like you have to drill it down and have a message uh, and then have signature talks and they can choose from those talks. That's why they picked you in the first place. And then it also makes sense like going into the talk, you have to know a lot of things. You got to know who is your audience, how many people are going to be there, what is the setup, uh, what do you need? Do you need um, just a PowerPoint presentation? Uh, what kind of microphone? Um, are there handouts that they're expecting? Like what what do they expect from you as a speaker? And then based on my audience, I always I never change the full message because that's why they hired me is to bring that message to the table. But I do make sure that I know who the audience is so that the stories that I'm telling are going to resonate with that group. Um, Amy, I'll give you an example. I did um, a, this conference, this Brewers conference in Las Vegas, and I got to speak at the Women in Brewing uh, session. And uh, I told a story about how I created a beer for the baseball team that I work for. And like, that was part of my, that's not part of my talk all the time, but that was part of that talk because I knew it would resonate with the audience and that story would land. Uh, when I spoke to women in engineering, you know, I do the same, same type of thing. Um, when I've spoken to women in real estate, I do that same type of thing. Like try to have some, some pieces that don't change your message, but that resonate with the audience that you're talking to. It's the same way you pitch a sponsorship or any type of sale you're doing, like you have to know who your audience is and, and, um, they need to be heard and, and know that you're talking to them specifically, not just delivering something generic or canned. Yes. hundred thousand percent. I am all about that. That is exactly what you have to do in any kind of marketing, but definitely speaking, um, going backwards, about 35, 40 seconds here. Uh, the ranges for keynotes are jaw dropping. Um, I think people listening to this are going to get fired up about their potential. Um, so many women that I've worked with have reached the status of not celebrity status, right? Cause it's totally different, but credibility, experience, respect. And this is something that should and could be very low hanging fruit, one or two a year, right? Um, you're making a business out of it. It's absolutely incredible. I, I kind of wonder to myself if you envisioned it for yourself at all, or if until you did the TED talk, you didn't see it, but it, can you, can you answer that? At what point did you realize there's a business here for me? Yeah. Well, one, I enjoyed it, which is crazy because in my book, like I talk about the fact and I talk about it in my keynotes, I was once too shy to order a pizza. I couldn't even dial the phone. And that's, that's the foundation like of my message is that we can grow as, as a person and we can change our attitudes by changing our behaviors and develop one of more confidence or whatever that attitude is that you want to adopt in, in your life. Um, I don't, so I, I will say this made me think back, like when I was young and as shy as I was, whenever we would have an assembly at school, like I wanted to be picked so bad. Like I wanted to go on stage. I think a lot of us were like that, you know, like, Oh, pick me. Like I want the magician to do the trick and I want to be a part of it. Um, so there was always kind of a pull to, to, to be in the front 
Um, I think that was a big driver in my, when I played sports, um, I wanted to be the best when I was in school, I wanted to be the best. Like when I was in, in my career, I wanted to work hard and, and be at the top. I was never happy with status quo. And so I think that when I saw the opportunity TEDx could provide, when I felt what it felt like to be on stage, when I heard the feedback from the audience, like, whoa, it really resonated when you said this, I'm going to start doing that today. I thought, wow, like how amazing is that, that I can deliver this message. And if I can affect just one person, I don't care how many people are in the room, if it's a thousand or 10, like if one person goes out and does this one thing and change their life. Like, I believe that can be a ripple effect. And like that for me was, um, was the catalyst. And I thought like, man, if I could get out there and do this more and impact more people and, and make them dream bigger and create bigger, more fulfilling lives for themselves in the workplace, like what impact does that have on that company? That is wild. Okay. And then what impact could that have in their lives where they go from living like Ho hum, just showing up every day to living a life of like greater intention and chasing their biggest goals. Like that's amazing to have that opportunity. So that that definitely lit a fire under me. Yeah, it is amazing. Um, you said it earlier. You you're you're giving them something that moves the needle. And when you said that, I mean, there's two angles. One is moving the needle in the company, right? Greater productivity, you know, corporate speak. But the other one is moving the needle inside their mind to say, I didn't think it's possible, but now it is. And I think I might know what I need to do next. So you're, you're getting up there and you're sparking inspiration. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you really enjoy doing it. Like the act of getting up there and the act of speaking gives you energy. And in all of my experience, um, as a professional, you know, in, in any aspect of my life is if you feel that fire, if you feel that energy, you are headed in the right direction. So you have to listen to that. How do I feel when I'm on stage? Right. Do I feel powerful? You know, do I want to do this again? Like when I ask that of myself, I actually feel like I have no interest in being on stage. It gives me anxiety thinking about it. Um, but I can hear it in in the way you talk and the way you your energy that you're bringing to the conversation is that you you enjoy it. Yeah, and it's not for everyone, which is the same for every job, right? Every job is not for everyone, uh, and that's why I encourage people when they ask like, "Where should I start?" Do it for free first. Go talk to your chamber of commerce. Go talk to the Rotary Club. They're always looking for speakers. They're not going to pay you. So you just can get up there and do your thing and see how it feels. I The first time I traveled to speak was, what year was that? 2019, I think. Was it 2019 or 2018? 2019. I went to, um, I got paid $600 and I got a, uh, I got but flight, um, hotel, and I got to invite another person to this conference. It was a, it was a, like a women in sports conference. And, um, I remember telling my husband, I was like, all right, I know this is like not a lot of money. Um, but what it is is an opportunity for me to try this and like, see how it feels and see if I like it. And I flew to Tucson and I was gone. I think I stayed there two nights and I got to bring my mentee, which was really cool. Like this girl I was mentoring in baseball, she played for another team. We'd never met in person. And I was like, Hey, I have a spot. Do you want to go to this conference? And she asked her boss and he said, yes. And like that in itself was just so cool. Like providing that opportunity to her was worth it, you know, times a million. Um, but I went and I'm like, after it was done, and I was nervous to speak. And I, you know, I, I don't know how good it was looking back. I probably fumbled my way through it a little bit because I was new. And when you're new at something, you can't be, you're not going to be the best. Like you have to give yourself time to grow. Um, but I left and came home and I'm like, man, you know, that'd be really cool to do that again. And I, I don't want to use this to just have, fly away all the time. Like I want to use this for impact, um, which is why it's awesome. You can do it virtually now. We'll do virtual keynotes. Um, every time I travel, I 
I, I usually am gone for only one night. Uh, I, I try not to leave for longer than, you know, 48 hours from home and, uh, I'm in and out on those flights and it's just, it's, it's fun. Like I like it personally, but on the broader scope, it's, it's, I'm thinking about the whole time. Like Oprah said, nerves are selfish. She said nerves are selfish because if you're nervous and too nervous to share your unique contribution, you're holding that back from someone. And so I thought about that a lot. Like that was my pump up early on in speaking was like, don't be selfish, Emily, like get out there and share because it can make an impact. And I don't get as nervous anymore. Um, but I do think about like getting up there and being so good. They won't forget me because I owe it to them to, to show up in the greatest, loudest, most energetic, leaderful capacity I can muster. Leaderful. I'm writing that down. Mm -hmm. Um, you reminded me when you said the Oprah quote about, um, nerves are selfish. I've heard that before. I really like it. I, uh, watched with my kids actually for the first time, sister act, uh, this past weekend. And it reminded me of the scene with the one really shy. Have you seen, you've seen mm -hmm. sister act, I assume, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming, but then again, I shouldn't, the really shy sister who has this really powerful voice and Whoopi Goldberg is like all right do it again and she kind of pushes her stomach and out comes this beautiful voice <laughs> reminded me of that moment and I, I you know it's true though um you have a gift you clearly have a gift Emily um getting up on stage getting in front of people sparking change inspiration moving the needle for them and sort of shining that light which is like like you said on the call where you sold yourself on the spot, like this is me delivering this talk in a way, you know, right now. And there's no way that anyone else is going to deliver it the same way. I mean, period. Right. Um, so you're contributing in the way that you can and you're enjoying it. And I think it's amazing and wonderful. Um, and also like, you're making a ton of money, like, come on, like if this is like a huge win. Um, so I bet your husband's happy that he let you go on that trip for 600 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I did, honey. Um, all right. So, um, one other quick question about this, just for those people listening that are trying to get an understanding of how they might be able to, you know, do some of this stuff for themselves. Um, you talked a little bit about the couple of uh, talks you gave, you mentioned Minnesota a couple of times. Um, who is really your target customer, right? And how do you identify an opportunity? Are you, you know, talk to me a little bit about how you find these opportunities and with what types of businesses and companies? Yeah. So my, I would say my niche has been women in, women in dot, dot, dot. So women in real estate, women in sports, uh, women in brewing, it is this wave that we are still riding that I hope we ride forever where we're very intentional about empowering and supporting women in the workplace and in their careers um, and the unique challenges that we face. And those groups have been gathering momentum and budget and space and time and taking up room which is so important. And uh, many of them have uh, given me, you know, paid me to come and talk to their groups uh, when, when the topic of confidence comes up. Um, I, I hope that I am elevating myself as, as the voice on confidence and one that can help you to increase yours and demonstrate the impact that it'll have on the whole person, both in business and in their life. I will say that I also speak to men and I love it when I'm at a women in event and there's men in the room and we call them, you know, a lot of different names, allies, or, you know, guys who somebody made them go right. Like, and they'll tell me that be like, Oh man, you know, I really wanted to show up to support them. And I was worried like that the talks were all going to be you know, down on men. And, um, I have to say like, your message is not just for women. Like I can use every single thing that you said. So 
while I have gotten so much opportunity in the women in, and I love that group and I want more opportunities um, in that sector, I can also speak to the whole conference um, because I also have that unique baseball angle and I can tell stories um, from working in baseball and applying the, the behaviors that I talk about with confidence in order to change attitudes through that lens, which is exciting for uh, any any gender to hear. So that's really, um, you know, where, where I shine. And I, I do think that for just, just the same advice that I give where you can't say you, you talk about anything. Um, you can't say that you talk to everybody. Like you have to start with a niche and then allow it to expand kind of on its own. Um, otherwise the leads are just, they're too vast and varied and you'll waste so much time sorting through like conferences or opportunities and trying to like fit your message into um, somebody else's program when it there might be an easier win out there. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, who is your talk for? And, you know, I do this a lot in my work. And if I'm creating an article for a client or if I'm writing something for myself, I want the people that I want to read it to feel like it was just for them. Um, that's why when people ask me why I would cut out half the population, um, in working with, you know, exclusively working with women owned businesses, I said, no, this made my job easier. Mm -hmm. Um, because I can make, I can create everything I create is for, is for them. Um, it's not to say it can't be for men. Of course it's for men. And, and, you know, you, you tapped on, you tapped into a really important point. Um, the work I do, the work you do, um, we are not uh, talking down upon anyone. We are not um, saying, woe is me. Um, this is not a sob story type thing. This is a celebration of the success that women have. Um, and in many cases, it, the success that women have um, is not clear of hurdles. Um, and in, in real talk, sometimes more hurdles than men, right? You said in the beginning, like we make the babies, like point blank, like there's just no question about that. We make the babies. So we are different. And so if you are, you know, going to have a child or if you do have children, you understand that. Um, historically, women didn't hold C-suite positions. Now they do. But you know what? The percentage of women in the C-suite globally is still like CEO is like three to five percent. Um, so this is why we're doing what we're doing and this is why it connects so much. And I love what you said about, you know, there's more space for this now. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, talks being carved out for women now. And so I can see why women in would be a powerful niche for you, but certainly not the only one. Um, you know, and, and I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the guts of your talks, um, because that's really, really important, right? You know, in the beginning, when you talked about the TEDx, TEDx Brett, we're going to call him, um, asking you, okay, why are you different? Um, at that point, maybe you didn't know. And now you've done the talk enough or variations of the talk enough where you're, you're probably so much more clear on why your talk is different and exactly what you're trying to accomplish with your audience. So I want to ask you, a little bit, you know, give us a little bit of insight into, you know, maybe pick a strategy, right? Um, you know, you said, I, I, I share strategies that empower confidence and, you know, quite frankly, you've mentioned like 12 of them already on this call indirectly, but <laughs> let's talk about your specific keynotes, right? What is one strategy or the most popular, or the, the one that connects the most, um, that you, you know, discuss in your talks? Uh, two come to mind. One was the, the most impactful in my own life. And then one is the one I get the most questions about. And so I'll go, I'll go with that one. So, um, what I do is, is talk about behaviors that you can start today to increase your confidence. And they're not, they're not that difficult, right? I'm not saying like run 10 miles tomorrow and your confidence will increase. No, it's, it's, 
The one I want to talk about is celebrate constantly. We live in this world where, you know, we talk a lot about goal setting, right? On this and and we're after the next thing. Um, and you, you might have a boss who you reach your goal in uh, early Q3 and he or she says, oh, we didn't set your goal high enough. Like you made it too early. And you're like, what the heck? Like I worked so hard for the first two quarters of this year and met my goal. And now we're saying it wasn't high enough. Like I'm talking about practicing the behavior of celebrating. So imagine that person who makes their sales goal the beginning of Q3. What are the behaviors that they were doing for those first six, seven months of the year? They were in the grind. They were making the phone calls. They were doing the thing. They were, whatever that job duty was, they were doing that relentlessly to reach their goal. When they got to their goal, one of two things happened. Either the boss says, not high enough, should have been higher. Like, let's increase it and see what you can do by the end of the year. Or that boss says, yes, like we did it. Let's celebrate, pack up your stuff, like go home early or let's go grab a drink, or um, I made an appointment for you to get a massage, or take Friday off, you made your goal, or here's X amount of money for achieving your goal early, right? Like that is that is celebrating. And now think about, Amy, what happens in your brain if you have the, the one I described first, the boss that says, oh, it wasn't high enough. Like, what do you, how do you feel about all that work you did to get to that point? Um, dejected. So, yeah. Versus how uh, you feel when they say, yes, we did it. Let's celebrate. That's what we should do. You're thinking like, okay, I do these behaviors and I get this reward. So whether that celebration comes externally from, from that, that boss, or it comes internally from you saying like, if I reach my goal, then this will happen. So if, if I reach my goal, I will, um, leave, leave work early, do something simple, or I will take my team out for drinks, or I will get a manicure, or I will, um, buy that belt I've had my eye on, right? Like you define the goal the, the, uh, the celebration of the goal before you reach the goal. So, you know, when I get here, this is what I will do. What happens when you celebrate is it creates this, this marker in your brain. Like it's really a hit of dopamine. Like that's, that's what happens in our brain. We, we like that. We say, oh, this is good. I made it. It was very uncomfortable to get here. It stretched me beyond my limits, but I made it. I survived. And then I got this great thing, this great uh, memory or, physical item or whatever it might be, because I celebrated that success. That act will grow your confidence because you know now that you can achieve or do or complete or reach that milestone. So celebrating constantly is what is one of the ingredients to increasing your confidence. If you don't recognize the success you've had, you can't replicate that success and seeing yourself be successful creates a more confident person because you can be confident in the fact that you can do hard things. You can reach your goal. You can work beyond your, your comfort zone. So celebrating constantly is, um, is a key ingredient to increasing your confidence. And it's one that I talk about in my keynote. And then I love it when there's time for a Q and a, Without a doubt, every single time I get asked about celebrating, how do I celebrate? When do I celebrate? What should I celebrate? What do I do if my culture isn't one of celebration? And um, I love diving into that topic because it is um, something we don't do. And it's, it's in all honesty, Amy, it's not that hard because you don't need to buy yourself an expensive purse to celebrate an accomplishment. Like it's about making that memory in your brain, um, letting you know that you freaking did it. Yeah. Now you've given us a sampling of your keynote. So thank you. Um, um please don't invoice me after this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, love. I love celebrate constantly. I absolutely love it. And you know, I'd be one of those people that would be thinking this as you're delivering this keynote. And actually I had this similar conversation at the gym the other day. 
is when I achieve my goal, what am I going to do? And I'm like, man, I don't know. I, I don't know because I don't want to make it about buying something because then I'm just spending money. And what am I buying? And like, I don't have, I'm not a collector. I don't have, you know, collections or I'm not an art collector. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I can buy myself a coffee, but I'm trying to stop doing that. <laughs> so um, it leads right into my question for you, right? Is what are your victory rituals, right? You're up there and you're saying celebrate constantly. Um how do you celebrate your wins, Emily? Uh, well, I'll tell you a little secret. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to be big at the end of every keynote, like my, um, my husband knows what my schedule, right. He knows I'm going to do the, the talk and, uh, he's such a great support of me. And when my keynote finishes, he always texts me and says, how did it go? And I always respond, I freaking killed it. And that for me is so small. It's only a text message, but that is a celebration. Like that is my equivalent to like a, a goal celebration or a high five. Like I remember that. Like I have so many memories of whether I'm standing in the green room or I'm back in my car or, you know, depending on the scope of the event, like wherever it is that I am um, back in my hotel room. I freaking killed it. Send, you know, and then him responding like, that's amazing. And whether it's your husband or your friend or your colleague or whoever, like your mom, your dad, like text, like that telling somebody else is so, it, it, it's so impactful because growing up, I don't, I know this is similar for so many women, we were told to stay quiet. Like if you talk too much, if you tell me you did a great job, you're conceited, you know, oh, you're self-absorbed, right? Like we've been trained to not celebrate our successes. So for me, just the act of a text or a phone call of telling somebody who loves me that like I did a great job and them being proud of me, like that's all I need. Uh, but I, I, the range is, is vast and varied. And when I did my first marathon, I planned after the race to, I found, uh, my family loves breweries. So I found a brewery in this like small town in California. And, uh, I knew that's where we were going when the race was done. My dad was there, my husband and my oldest son. And, um, that's what I remember. Like, I remember these snippets of running, but I remember like crossing the finish line. I knew those guys were going to be there. And then I remember like, walking into that brewery, like having a beer and a pizza with my family and knowing that that was going to be my like reward for finishing this race. Like that was enough. That was enough for me. So, um, it, 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 those are some examples of, of ways that you can celebrate that aren't going to, uh, cost a lot of money or require a ton of planning, you know, just, find a, find a great friend and let her, or him cheer you on. I love it. Um, I can feel the power in the text message and it's not something I had really thought about before. Right. And it makes sense though, because you're, you're putting it out of yourself and into the world and you're letting someone else receive it. The act of telling someone about your win, um, your success, it is powerful. And it is a reward in that sense. And so I'm glad you, you brought that up. I, I didn't, I didn't consider it. Right. Um, and the after party, like, the, you know, what am I going to do when I finish? We're going to, we're going to go and we're going to go to this brewery or, you know, I'm going to invite one of my friends to meet me for, you know, a drink later. Or I love that just very simple ways to celebrate constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, I, something else I made note of here was, it feels to me like, at least in this particular lesson, um, the way you positioned it was, you know, the manager is the person who needs to learn that they need to create a culture of celebration. Um, not so much the employee, right? Like the employee is the one doing the hard work, the manager, the chief revenue officer, if you will, as I wrote down CROs, people that manage sales teams. Um, you know, how do, how do I create a culture fix of success? I am put emphasis on the celebration. I think that's really impactful. Just that, 
one point. Um, so I can see why you've been successful. <laughs> um, all right. So let's skip, let's skip to the end here. Uh, I think we're at about an hour, which always, you know, flies by when we're having fun. Um, let's talk about what wins you have coming up. You only briefly mentioned your book and I don't want to gloss over the book. Um, so I definitely want to hear how the book is going. Um, and when it is officially going to land in my mailbox, because I purchased one. Um, and then what other wins are you working toward? I know you have goals, um, in 2024 specifically, um, and let's, let's put that out into the world so that, um, you know, the, the universe can help you achieve it. I love that Amy, because, um, one, I love that you asked about compensation because we don't talk about that enough. And that was it's for whatever reason, it's hard for us to discuss, but we need to talk about it more, uh, so that we can all earn, um, and two, I love that you said, tell us about what's coming up so we can put it out in the universe because to everyone listening to this, like, don't shy away from sharing your goals because you never know who's listening, who might have an opportunity for you. Um, so a couple things, the book comes out this year. I talked to the publisher yesterday and I don't have a date, um, specifically it's spring whatever spring means to you. I was like, is that the end of March? <laughs> and they're like, well, I don't know if it's the end of March. I'm like at the first week of April, they're like, Emily, we don't have a date. I'm like, okay, well, all right, spring. Okay. We're sticking with spring. Um, the book was amazing. I, I did that. Um, I wrote the book last year, literally started in January, turned in, um, the final manuscript to proofreading in December. Uh, and right now working on the different cover designs. So for everyone who pre-ordered a book, thank you so much. Uh, you'll be getting emails shortly to help me choose the cover, which is really exciting. Um, and um, for those who haven't bought the book, you can purchase a copy at emilyjansen.com. So the book is a huge thing this year. Um, other thing that I'm working on, my goal is to book 24 in 24. I want to book 24 keynotes in 24. And, um, that's exciting because it's, you know, 24 more organizations times the number of people that I can get out there and share this message of building confidence. So if anyone's listening and interested in hearing more, learning more about me, um, again, emilyjansen.com, J A E N S O N. Uh, that's a big goal for this year. And I also started grad school, um, at Arizona state university, Amy, Wow. Uh, and the, um, what I'm studying is positive psychology. And the reason I signed up for my master's is because I preach curiosity. Um, I read constantly. I've got books literally stacked all over my house that I'm always wanting to, to learn more so I can better support everyone around me. And I thought that, you know, with a lot of these companies I'm speaking to fortune 500 companies, like I, I want to be the best I can be. And I want to also do that in a formal way. So I think earning my master's is, is a great way to add credibility to what I'm doing, um, beyond just the experience and that I have and, and the interviews, um, that I've done. So, so that's big for this year. And I also, um, I still do consulting work with, with clients where I help uh, companies to uh, make smart decisions in their marketing, um, help them with their strategic partnerships and um, in sponsorship and in, in marketing. So that is a ton of fun and um, where I built my career. So I really love working with clients as well. So that's, that's kind of the, the layout for 2024. Um, and then we talked up a little bit about running, uh, my, I'm running a marathon on February 10th in Mesa, Arizona. I cannot wait for that to be over <laughs> to be honest with you. Like I'm so excited and feel so blessed to be ready to do another race, but it's like when you get so close to something, like you just want it to happen now. Um, Mind you, tomorrow I have a 20 mile run and I'm just like, gosh, could it just be marathon day? Like I would rather just have it be marathon day. 
Um, so I'm still working on my fitness and then always stuff with the kids, um, with their sports and, and travel and making memories with them. The next episode we record will be called how to stretch your 24 hours into 60. <laughs> hey, Jensen, um, you have amazing goals for 2024. Originally when I saw 24 and 24, I thought it was 24 months and now I know it's 12. So yes, let's go. Um, the title of your book, just remind us what it is. Let's go a guide to increasing your confidence. Okay. And you mentioned that was available on your website, which will be in the show notes. Um, before I wrap with my final question, I want to point out here, like this show is about, you know, big wins, right? Like what is the win? What is the, the big win that really launched you, you know, to where you are today? And clearly here in this, this episode, it is about this Ted talk, but I want to point out you know, one of the themes in the work I've done now for a super long time is small wins um, are not insignificant to the journey or the results that you have um, in your career, in your life as a business owner. Um, Emily, in your story, it just rings true. There were so many small wins that led to the big win. Um, sometimes the act of being prepared or trying something once or twice before you even know what it will be for you is is a small win in the larger picture, right? Um, you know, the image that I I have in my head um, from years ago, it's, you know, it said 100 ones adds up to 100. Um, stack up your small wins, right? And then you'll you'll have your big one. And, and it's, it's interesting here with this particular story that this TED Talk came from, you know, a series of experiences and events and, you know, your own confidence building as someone who was a shy person and, you know, but did want to get out of that and did maybe want to get on stage and didn't know what that meant. And then, you know, fast forward to here we are and you're bringing in, um, what is it? One, two, three, five figures, um, maybe perhaps on average, um, per talk, um, 24 and 24. I think you can, you can absolutely do this. Um, I see the path. I, it's, it seems like it's a clear path. Uh, and the opera there's ripe opportunity here for you. Um, we need to talk offline about Mesa. That's about 20 minutes away from where I live. Um, so maybe we can find time to meet up live and off zoom. Um, but thank you so very much for sharing all this. This has been really incredible, um, insight around, you know, not only how to kind of feel your way through, uh, you know, your personal success, um, whether you're inside an organization or on the outside and your in your case, you found yourself on the outside and then you were able to transfer it into this profitable, sustainable business. Um, uh, the final two questions I have for you are, uh, what are you going to do when you uh, do 24 talks in 24? <laughs> What's your, what are you going to do to celebrate? And then finally, um, what advice do you have uh, for women entrepreneurs um, at any point in their journey who are either, you know, just getting started or dreaming of the idea of being an entrepreneur, or maybe they're there, um, they've achieved it and uh, they're midway through or even at the end, right? Um What's your gem uh, and takeaway? Yeah, uh, I would say for women entrepreneurs, it always goes back to sales. It always goes back to sales. And in order to be effective at selling, you need to believe in yourself and your product and what you're offering and put yourself out there. I will tell you that when I did the pre-sale for my book, I had an uh, email marketing I did social media, uh, but the number one thing that sold all the books and the keynotes associated with the books is one-to-one -one outreach. So that was individual emails, text messages, phone calls. You got to do one-to-one. -one. And that is a sales effort, a sales effort. Yes, there's a marketing funnel that you can do via email, but especially when you're first starting out, you don't have a huge engaged email list, like you've got to just ask people for the sale. And I mentioned it in this call, like I'm at the point where 
in order to reach my goals, I got to ask people for the sale. So I have to go back to my roots that have produced every result I've ever had and sell. Uh, so, so that's, that's the advice I would give and, and believe in yourself, right? Like I say this to myself literally every day. Why not you? Like, why not me? Why not you? Right? Like all these other people, we're all just people. And someone had the audacity to dream a little bigger and work a little harder and, and make their dream happen. So why not you? Yeah. And then how about your celebration? Do you have a celebration? Yeah. My celebration will likely involve champagne because it'll be at the end of the year. Uh, it'll be a lot. I think it'll be a lot of things. So it will definitely be, uh, champagne. I love that one. Cause it's, it's like, that's what that was made for. Right. Um, and it will also be, uh, thank yous to all the people that helped me get there who will be so delighted to celebrate my success, whether that's through text, um, through cards, through reach out, but, um, we're going to celebrate that together because Amy, as you say, like wins are not achieved alone. Like it's a collective effort of a lot of people that, um, you've been able to rally around you through your good work, good attitude and reputation. So that's how I'll celebrate champagne and thank yous. Champagne and thank yous. I love it. I love the picturing you sitting there writing handwritten thank you notes or sending texts and just sort of sending the gratitude out in the world in the form of your personal celebration. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stick that one in my pocket. I'm going to use that again. I'm going to try that for myself. Um, well, thank you again, Emily. This has been an amazing episode and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me today. My pleasure, Amy. Anytime. <laughs>